Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take one giant book, difficult book, break it down bit by bit, section by section, talk about it, analyze it, laugh about it, make jokes. I'm Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and I'm joined as always by Brian Wood. Hi, Chad. How are you doing? That's all. I was going to do a, oh, yeah. a dad joke about viruses, but fuck that. I'm fine. Let's just let's just do this. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my setup joke, I have two jokes that I set up. One is that tomorrow is opening day for baseball. So mm-hmm. I have my hat and my baseball shirt on that says it's not okay, which is also probably pretty appropriate. Um, and that was, that was going to be my dad. And my dad bit was about preparing for baseball. Okay. Let's, let's go right play, past that. I'm going to play. I'm going to be the show all day tomorrow. And that's it. <laughs> I'm just going to start a season. And that season's going to exist. And it is going to be glorious. And this week we have a special guest, Derek Main, who does the um, YouTube channel, Read the World, and does uh, reviews on there. Uh, how frequently do you post them? Uh, twice a week is usually my go-to. Uh, right now it's a little different because the world is ending. But before the world was ending, twice a week was a good uh, good barometer. Nice. Nice. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Brian. I'm excited. Yeah. And I'm, I'm great to have you. How did you get started doing that? Well, I just had a really, really lonely niche hobby, which was – translated literature and it, there was not <laughs> anyone <laughs> there was not anyone in my immediate world friends or family even folks that were readers you know they maybe knew Bolaño and that would be like the extent of it you know so uh, I actually did it to make friends like most things you know <laughs> I was just like, Perhaps if I talk about this, I will find other people that like this thing. And that's how that's the, the last the last three cults that I got into were all for finding friends, and they ended up not being the best of friends. They all tried to kill me. You know, which is weird. <laughs> when you're when you're wonderfully like greeted into the cult, they're probably gonna kill you. So but they are not your friends. They're there to, to drink to drink your gallbladder. <laughs> except, except with the commune slash cult that Anthony I are starting. Ours is okay. very it's safe. No weird sex shit. Yeah. <laughs> where, are you, where are you based out of, Derek? Uh, Ra- out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay, cool. Which, which, which stores do you like to frequent down there? Seeing as I, I used to live and work at Quail Ridge Books. I, I know Apex, um, but I, I think I only went to Apex like once. Yeah, I mean, we just and we just moved Apex like literally a year ago for space. Mm-hmm. We lived in Raleigh throughout. I really like uh, the Regulator Bookshop in yeah. Durham. It's, it's a really great spot. Flyleaf is awesome. I think I had mentioned to you before that like they did not have much in the way of open letter. And I was surprised about because it's a pretty indie hip. Yep. Uh, but uh, Quill Ridge is great. I mean, they have a, tr- they have probably the best dedicated translated literature section, but Quill Ridge is now they've moved since you were probably here and they're in a really kind of upscale shopping center. It, it just kind of attracts, it's a great store, but it attracts just a kind of a different vibe. It's not like as much of a fun shopping experience, frankly, as like Flyleaf. Yeah, I really like Flyleaf. Um, when I worked at Quail Ridge, we were still at the um, whatever that Maplewood Shopping Center. What was it called? Something like that. Yeah, like next to Whole Foods. Probably. Right next to Whole Foods. Yep. yep, exactly. Yeah, and that was that was great. That was a great little store. And the last time I went through North Carolina, it was still there, but it, they were moving like a few months later, like not yeah. that long after. But when I was there too. The regulator was great when I was living there, which would have been in the late '90s. Um, the regulator was great, but then when I went back at some point, it seemed like they had like really fallen off. And then it, they did they get new owners that a couple of years ago that brought them back. They, I mean, I don't know. They must have though, because I, I'll tell you, when you walk in, like their little circle of staff picks and stuff is. Uh, it's basically my Twitter timeline of great translated literature. I mean, nice. Deep Bellum, Open Letter, uh, Europa Editions. Like, and, and it's not, you know, you couldn't even, I'll, I'll give you a good example. When the whole American Dirt controversy was going on, mm-hmm. you walked into Quail Ridge, there was a big American Dirt display with oh. a ton of books and like obviously the marketing piece or whatever. When you went to Flyleaf, like they had it, you know, on a big table with a bunch of other stuff. I couldn't even find it in the regulator. Like, <laughs> so those are sort of the three different, I would say, like, you know, ways in which they interact with their community. 
Interesting. That's really man. Remember when American Dirt was a controversy? Those were the good old days. I know. Isn't that like so? <laughs> that would be such a lovely controversy right now. I wish oh, there was the biggest thing happening in in the book publishing world. I, would, uh, I, I think I really bummed out my class today. I just was too honest, and and by the end I was like, "You guys, do you guys even read right now? Like, are you are you reading?" And they're like, "No." And I was like, "Does it? Do you find any comfort in reading?" And they're like, "No." I was like, are you going to buy a book anytime soon? They're like, no. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. So, oh, that sounds like a good, good situation for all of us. Oh, man. Anyways, I suppose well, we should talk a little bit about The Dream Part by Rodrigo Frezan, which is the book that we're reading this week um, or this season. And this section that we're going up to is the end of the first part. So from page like 57 up through whatever, 111. And the first part, which was called that night, but notes for an encyclopedia of sleepwalkers. Um, but before we get into all that too, Derek, you, how familiar are you with Frazan? Did you, you read the invented part? Yep. Just this series. This is the only work of his that I've read is the invented part. And then now the dream part. Awesome. Have you finished the dream part? I have. Yep. I okay. finished it, uh, about a month ago. I was going to wait. I read the invented part along with the, the two months yeah. podcast. Mm. And I loved it. It was a great way to interact with it. And then I could not wait uh, and went ahead and piled through it. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were a little late getting started, too. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Ducks, Newberry Pook, Ducks Newberry Port took a lot out of us, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 15 episode series. <laughs> like that's, a, that's a monster. I did not join you on that journey. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book. One thing, too, before we go too much into this is that for everyone listening or watching, for up through until April 1st, the ebook of The Dreamed Part is available for free on our website. You can just download it immediately. Um, we want to encourage people while you're in quarantine or self-isolation or staying, staying at home or whatever term people are using um, to be able to join us on every Wednesday, have some fun, relax, and we don't want the, the ability to not be able to get the book to be a burden. So you can just go download it right now for free. You can also get all of our other eBooks for $3.99 because we cannot ship physical copies of anything for the time being. We can't go on campus. So we can't go to our office. So I don't know what that means. So if you do want to order a physical book, we will send it to you when we can. But in the meantime, we will send you the eBook for free um, just so that you have something. So <sighs> well, all we can do. Anyways, how did you like the invented part? I love it. It was the, I don't know, second or third best book I read that entire year. I mean, it was incredible. It, it, it took me back a little bit to, I, see, I don't read that kind of like maximalist literature very much anymore, you know, but there was a time where I was obsessed with, you know, that level of like postmodern referential type stuff. And I felt like he was doing it in a totally fresh and different way. And one of the things I said in my review of this, and it's true of the invented part as well is, he does this really cool thing with the plot where there is a kind of a central, really sad plot happening underneath the whole time. And it'll just be mentioned in like two sentences of a huge, you know, 200 page, whatever, you know, like uh, rant. And, and I really like how it's like, it's not really threads. It's kind of just sort of underneath is this actual pulsating story that is actually really painful to, to write, I think, and to read. So I like it a lot. I actually think you were talking about the ebook. I think you could read this first. I think you could read it in any order. I you, you disagree? I mean, I think that there's, there's no, I don't disagree. I think that there's things in here that are references to the earlier, to the invented part, that if you've read the invented part, you know what that reference is. Like this is the section, I believe this is the section where, yeah, where he describes the Onarium or whatever it is. And he talks about like imagining a museum that he'd already imagined where this young couple stood in front of it and he, they were no longer a young couple and they kept meeting. And that is from the invented part. So like you would miss out on some things like that. And you might just be completely like, a little bit lost at first, but once you get past this section, um, I think that every, I don't think there would be a problem. I think this section is like the tall ask if you were gonna start that way, but not, but it, it's not insurmountable by any means. See, I, I feel lost when I start off a section with him, no matter what. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm always lost. <laughs> and then you kind of just have to trust him, which you'll do after like 100 or 150 pages in and be like, okay, he's a master of this. He'll guide us there. But I, I think the lostness would not bother me. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, it's like, Dialogue is lame. I hate dialogue. All right, here's a big section of dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, like, yeah, you just like, just sit back and enjoy the ride. Yeah. <laughs> there right. is, so with this section, one thing I realized as I was reading for today, for the, the third time I've read this book, is that a lot of the things that I had, I had reprocessed this in my mind, like this section, the section is told essentially out of order. Like it's, it's not like what you're saying about like the, the sad, the real story is underlying. This section is like completely out of order. Like the thing, like if you were to put this into a chronological timeline of how things happen, he, the writer is going to write a script about dreams. There's writing for, for about dreams for a TV or film script or place, whatever production. And so he goes to this place where they're researching dreams to try and learn about how dreams work. There he meets Ella, who's from his dream, and they're able to see his dream in there, and that 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 is the girl that he that he sees. They then ha make love and have the whole long conversation. And the next morning, she tells him that they're trying to do an experiment in which they're going to make your dreams efficient, and that you could work in your dreams. There wouldn't be dreams like they are now. And then that leads to the White Plague, which is the beginning of our of this chapter where everyone can no longer dream because of this experiment went wrong. And even in the section at the end where he's talking to her, he's like, they never like, there's always side effects. Like you always, scientists say they have this plan to make things better and it always leads to some other fucked up thing. And so in this case, it leads to the white plague where nobody can dream and he's the only one who can still dream. And so he's going there and is anointed at this place because he's the only one in the world that's still dreaming and they're trying to figure out how to fix their problem. But that's all reversed in here. And, um, and, it made me think that as I, as I hit the, like I said it last week about their, their, the test and how this all worked, but it hadn't occurred to me that it's not till the very end. But as I started thinking about how it's, it's kind of like inverted or almost like a infinity loop of, of like the narrative logic. Um, there's the middle point is his dream. And so the dreamed part is the main part of this section, but we're, we're surrounding it by two other things. Um, but it's really, it's, it's, I, I didn't, I get really fascinated by his structures. And I think it does take me reading it slowly like this to really see like how all these pieces come together, especially like in the past when I've read this, it's for like editing it line by line or checking every, every typo, which I found another one this time. I'm, I've found three mistakes I've made so far. Um, pissed me off. But, but there's a lot of words. So it's like three out of like whatever. That's a really good percentage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like a cool example would be, I really like page, I haven't read through everything. So I'm, I'm going through this completely blind, only section by section. So yeah. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about, which is normal. It's par for the course for me. But uh, like I liked on page 67 um, in the middle of it. So it mentions the white plague. Um, something horrible was unleashed. Something was unleashed that could not be put back. If sleep deprivation is a direct route to psychosis, then dream deprivation, and you get like that cliffhanger. Right. Yep. So what happens when we get dream deprivation? And then like there's like a little payoff, maybe on page 85 um, when he goes, uh, when he talks about um, psychopaths, like people that aren't or, or, or what happens in like the uh, Dick Kruger when the when a teen stopped, like they all go crazy. Right. So it's kind of like foreshadowing, you know. What, what what could be happening when there's dream deprivation and as, as it's starting to come, right, versus sleep deprivation. But just just tiny little, like, breadcrumbs that he'll sprinkle along every now and then. It's only a line somewhere packed in this giant, dense, you know, max like maximal, energetic, exuberant paragraph. You'll get, like, that one little line every now and then that's like, uh-oh. <laughs> but I thought that was a great example on like 67, right? Yeah. Well, well, what happens when you have dream deprivation and the white plague and so. And actually on there, page, is, yeah. there is a, a plot, but yeah. Uh, on page 91 in, during the conversation, there's a mention from Ella too saying those who never, so this would be before the white plague, you know, those who never remember their dreams are more likely to end up being 
Contrary to the, the depiction of them insisted on in movies as visionaries when they close their eyes, dangerous psychopaths, mad scientists, serial killers. Serial killers, yeah. yeah. Which my wife never remembers her dreams. So when I, oh, when I, I never like, do oh, either, this awesome. really scared me. <laughs> oh my god! I, I like, I like to like, oh, perfect. I remember my dreams like vivid, precise That's dreams, like, almost all the time. And I'm I was super pissed this week before this, especially last night um, was okay, but the night before, all my dreams were just like clutter, and I couldn't get anywhere, and everything was just like. I was trying to take a shower in the gym and it was like all the doorways led to not the shower and I couldn't find my pants and like every, there was just stuff everywhere. And I was like, it was like a true anxiety dream. And I was like, fuck this. This is bullshit. My dreams are supposed to be the good place. Like I am not happy about this. I have this city that I go to all the time. It's consistent. I, I enjoy it there. I know where things are. My, my happiness is there. There's certain people that recur over and over again. But then I get this clutter dream. No, I'm not going to stand for it. <laughs> right, but the line I liked before there was, and the statistics confirm that more creative people remember their dreams more and better than more rational and pragmatic people. I was like, oh, thank God, I'm not a rational or pragmatic person. Well, the rational versus we, creative is a theme throughout this whole section. Like, yeah. So. Well, especially in the dialogue that they have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which which has a direct mention of Twin Peaks multiple times. I was wondering when you were going to get to that. Uh, 16 minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah, because even when I was counting, yeah, <laughs> not bad. Cut on it. 16 minutes is as long as I lasted. <laughs> but this, I thought that this section, even more so than the first half, I thought that this one really rang. Like, I love this part. Like, I love the beginning with all the recurring uh, dreams of Ella, but I think that it really, in the second half, becomes something like truly amazing and, uh, and works as a whole. I mean, these. It is interesting with his books that these sections are like almost like little novellas of a sort. And that they, once you have the whole, read the whole thing, it's easier to like see how it all fit together and what was going on. And I, I really, I think he's, I, he's brilliant. And this is a, a brilliant section for that reason. And super fun. Yeah. <laughs> the whole, when he brings up Lynch, actually, there's two parts of this section where his referential stuff is so much fun to read. When he brings up Lynch, he goes through like a litany of movies and it's awesome, you know, like a litany of movies and directors. But then he does the same thing with music early on, too. Yep. Page, uh, and, this is the playlist for this season, page 62. I was going to hear Enter Sandman this time, but I'm afraid of Metallica will sue me. Well, I was impressed with the Bell and Sebastian pull. Like, I mean, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. I was like, that's a wild find that I would not have guessed. Like, yeah, like, I mean, I like, because we, we're used to now Bob Dylan, King Talking Heads. We're used to, and Bell and Sebastian, it's like, that's a little later and more indie, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't even know which album that's from. I don't either. I'd never I know. I always that. picture Rodrigo as just decrepit and old he is with some of the hip <laughs> some of the hip references from the the early 2000s <laughs> <laughs> only going back only going back 20 years <laughs> well the one right after is Frank Sinatra so that's back to yeah and, and Bob Dylan's on the next page well and Bob Dylan's throughout right that's the song he can't remember yeah 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 exactly and the author that he can't remember is Nabokov obviously yeah and let's come up at the end too Norbakov, or however you say his name. Nabokov, Nabokov. Norbakov, Nabokov, Nabokov, Nabokov. Vladimir. I thought, is there a way that Vladimir said I, differently. It's not Vladimir. It's like Vladimir. Um, when you look it up online, it's very weird. Um, I found that once when I was trying to figure out how to say anything correctly and can't. I listened to the uh, Talking Heads song Dream Operator Uh Quite a few times because I wasn't. I, I was. I know quite a few Talking Head songs. I didn't know that one, um, and it was really delightful uh, hearing it and then you know reading it and the lyrics and having the lyrics in it. Like that might be a good one for this. Uh, yeah. For this section, it seems important to it. Seems definitely important. So, but I, I still go. I think we should just be Mariah Carey this whole <laughs> this whole season. Dude, I had to watch that video in order to get that song for last week's thing. And my God, what did we grow up in? <laughs> how nine? How nineties is that video? You guys, if you're listening, go go Google uh, Dream Lover or whatever Mariah Carey. That is a great music video. It is it a will time capsule. Blow your mind. In 1991, <laughs> weird. <laughs> We were very weird. 
Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So yes, it's a, I, I summed up the plot part of that, which is fun. So like, I don't know, I don't know where we want to take this. So, um, it's gonna be different. Well, like, like speaking of, um, I thought Derek brought up a really great point about how he kind of like slides in this like something really sad, usually like just in a in a line, and for me that happened on, uncoincidentally on page sixty nine, sorry, uh, <laughs> right near the top, um, it talks about. Um, seeing, seeing Aya, and it's the woman of his dreams. Mm -hmm. And just how sad it is to have the woman of your dreams because it's kind of been set up where like you, you don't get, if you dream it, it's gone. Or if you, like it's setting it like, don't, oh, don't be in love with her. Don't call her the woman of your dreams. That means this is gonna be tragic and terrible. Like this can't, this isn't gonna end well, is it? And it's just, a, it's just one line, but just the fact that it's, it's the, the, the author's calling her the woman of his dreams is like, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> it's called the dream in the dream part. It's like, oh, that's worrisome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't seem promising. Yeah, I all the parts that I had marked for my favorite lines are all related to that too. It was sort of breaking me up a little bit. Like, it seems to, it's very sad and very intense, and like the emotional parts of it are are really wild. Like, like the related to what you just said on page seventy. Happy because unlike his recurrent dream of Ella or Aya, nobody was and nothing could wake him up now. He could no longer feel the sadness when he opened his eyes. The melancholy of wondering how much time would pass before their next meeting in his dreams. Yeah. yeah way to pick the most Chad, depressing Chad part <laughs> oh, of this. Don't, don't worry, I've got more. I've got <laughs> a lot more to talk this time. I was reading this alone in the morning, being like, fuck. <laughs> I don't know that I'm emotionally prepared for this, Rodrigo. See, it's interesting. When I do a first read of him, I am uh, sad at points like that. But every time I reread, like I did with this, I'm cracking up laughing most of the time. It's the humor the second time around that, like, he does something really cool on 74, where, first of all, he has a great line, which he admits is a great line. It's like, Night is the factory of tomorrow in the museum of, of yesterday. Someone else wrote, and yes, he does remember that someone is and was him. At the end of that paragraph, it says, yes, it's a good line, which I love that. Like that, I love that. But then the next sentence, and if museums are the place where infinity goes up on trial, like that's obviously a direct call to the Bob Dylan line, you know, um, and who's somebody he's talked about throughout. Like, and it's just like little funny referential hints like that, that the second time I can. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that this space, I, it's not like it works under dream logic, although it sort of does, I guess, but there are like all these little, like right below that is one of the hints of to like the plot. So like you're saying, there's those little, little droplets that come through, but it's the thing from before, the thing about the experiment, the thing about the onerium, something went wrong there, something was set adrift, floating the waves into a nightmare with no land and state where it can open its eyes, is like an obscure sort of reference to what the, the plot thread of that is. Um, right next to like everything else, it's like very woven. This section and and does have that sort of like dreamlike quality in the sense that dreams have so many weird layers and little bits to them that seem to stand out. But like, uh, like if you can't remember your dreams, maybe you don't know what I'm even talking about. Your dreams can be anything. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Remember my daydreams, but not when I'm actually sleeping. I don't think I would be able to. What? Why would I remember dreams when I'm just plotting to kill everybody? <laughs> I've got I've got better things to worry about. <laughs> you know how hard it is to be psychotic? <laughs> it's a lot of effort. You have to be like really like Hannibal Lecter and shit. That's a lot. That is a lot of calories going to those thoughts. <laughs> I mean, you first off have to come up with your own brand. Like what's gonna distinguish you? <laughs> what's your yeah. name going to be? <laughs> Oh no! Okay, no more serial killer talk. <laughs> but there's but there's something about like dreams that are textures. There's a texture to them, and there's little things that sort of recur or that weave themselves throughout. And in a sense, this whole chapter seems to be like he's trying to explain what it is to describe a dream without being like well taking into mind all those dictums and cliches about like tell a dream, lose a reader, do this, lose that, and like there's that great bit somewhere in here of like oh yeah, it's right there, it's seventy five. How, how many possible readers has he already lost? I mean, written like yeah. back in the day and like, but it does feel in tying into like the writer trying to figure out how to, how to create a dream, film a dream or put a dream into film that would make sense. This question is almost like looking on like 
creating a dream without being so explicitly like, this is a dream, this is blank. But like the, the logic of it sort of works the same. And the sort of the way that the, the plot's inverted, that seems to happen in my dreams all the time. Like the, the it's a very like Pintonian thing too, of like the explanation comes after the, the self consciousness. You're always getting things flipped around. Um, there's a term for that too. It's like prolipsis or something like that. Someone smarter knows what I'm talking about. But it's like a way in which you reverse cause and effect in book to like create a, a different sort of tension. And that's happening in here specifically because we know that the ending part, but not the why of it until the very last, very last, very last bit. Yeah, I like the idea of um, you had mentioned it briefly. I just thought it was such a neat line where you talked about. Um, like, you know, dialogue is supposedly communication, but he prefers the liquid syntax of thought or something, something along that. Like it's some, some great line, like, fuck, I wish I, I wish I would have wrote that. Damn. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I like that idea of like within dreams, like the juxtapositions can be so crazy because you're not trying to think of them or make them logical or try to make sense of it. And it has this way of communicating something that's, not possible if you're if you're cogent and trying to order them in a way, you know. And that's the thing. There's I don't a, know if any of that makes any yeah, sense, but no, 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 it, it definitely does. Because there's even the line in here where it talks about like when people wake up and recount their dreams, they force them into a logical order. Like you tend to like yeah. fill in the gaps and refix things because you want it. You want need a narrative, so you create like that sort of narrative. Whereas like the real dream itself is much more sporadic and like disconnected. Um, and that's just the way that yeah. lines work. And so it, it does make it like the idea of like having the importance of dreams within this is like really central because it does end up as that balance of like the rational world versus the less creative unhinged world where you're not in control of things. Like the kind of yin and yang of like waking and sleeping is really, really key. And it seems to be like a theme that kind of plays throughout here too. One, but I want to say one thing first, but besides that, on 77, Brian, here we go. He always had the uncertain certainty that it seems to look and sound like a certain music video from the golden age of MTV, like Mariah Carey, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a dream of mom cut off jeans and <laughs> bunches of people singing in the field. <laughs> so I had this weird experience growing up where um, I grew up right when MTV had, was just starting. Um, and my parents were in college when I was a kid. And so MTV was always like nonstop on the TV all the time. Cause it was like this new cool thing. Like, Hey, look, you can see the dire straits video. This is amazing. Or, you know, whatever the, <laughs> yeah. uh, so all like, like pre, like probably like from like 84 to 80. Yeah. It would have been like 84 to like 87. I watched every single second of MTV that ever existed. Oh um, like on, on, on constant loop. Cause it was, like, it, it was like the iPad. It was like the iPad to keep me from crying as a kid that all, all of our kids are watching the like Johnny, Johnny and the shark dance thing. Like, yeah. And so this, this golden age of MTV is like right in my wheelhouse. Like that is like stuck being like three, four, five, six, watching everything MTV. I can't. <laughs> my God. It was, my golden age was 120 minutes. Obviously that was like, that was, that was it, and that was uh, that was a common yeah. time. Yeah, like oh man, those are fun days. That was when MTV was fun. I don't know what it is anymore. I think it's just movies or TV shows about kids that are pregnant, right? I have. Uh, I, I think I think real real world kind of ruined it because they got such great ratings from reality television. They just kind of spun off that way and kind of ditched music videos. And plus, like. I think Hype Williams ruined it too because every music video has to cost like $9 million now and have like people smoking cigars on a yacht with a helicopter and like <laughs> that shit got too expensive. And it's like, no, just like do a YouTube video. And you're good. Dude, that's what I every, every day. That's what I'm just out on those yachts yeah. with cigars. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 speaking of like today's music, <laughs> sp speaking of uh, today's music, how great. Would it be for, I, I want to know what Rodrigo's, we'll ask him when he's on, but um, his thoughts on the uh, Billie Eilish's Where Do We Go When We Dream, or what is the name of her album? Oh. I don't listen to her, so I don't know, but she has that terrible, it's like the stupidest name for an album, right? Like, Where Do We Go When We Dream, or it has, I'm gonna find it. sorry, I'm, I'm not hip with anything new, but. Um, <laughs> it is called. It seems like the wheelhouse of music. Do we all fall asleep, where do we go? 
Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Holy shit, it's really dumb. When we all fall asleep, where do we go? And it's in all caps. And the first song is just seven exclamation marks. <laughs> That's it. Hell yeah. That's right. Oh my goodness. Yep. So I take back no talking heads. I want the seven exclamation. I don't know what that song is, but let's do seven exclamation points for the start of this. Uh... <laughs> 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 Some exclamation point works for me. Yeah, because where do, where do we go when we're when we're asleep? You know, because we're not here. One of the things that that I marked down here too that I think about is like when he's talking about dreams in the conversation with Ella, he says like there seems to be a way that it's almost commenting on literature as a whole. Then like page one hundred five is it says like what what we're after, what we're seeking is for our dreams to become practical and useful and in a way rational. So we could keep working on our dreams so we could find practical and logical solutions in them. So in a way, our dreams could be made reality because they're reality, they're realistic, logical, going from A to B and not from C to X. Um, and I thought that's kind of like how, you know, MFA, University of Iowa writing is supposed to be of like clear, concise, whatever. And he's like, no, dreams are important. The way that he writes is very much not that. It's like the opposite of that. And this section really informs that. And shows that, demonstrates it. And uh, I kind of thought, they, there's always times in his books where I feel like it's a commentary on the literary scene, but like, a, a, but from a different angle. That's not really saying it directly in this case. Yeah, I, 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 I so completely. I have the next little paragraph highlighted as well, where it seems to me some apparently irrational things are the foundations atop which reason is held up and erected and fortified. Maybe, as they say, when we dream, we let ourselves go mad for a while, and that's how we're able to tolerate seeing ourselves forced to be sane so much of the time, the other two-thirds of our lives, right? That, that part really I, – I really, really liked that juxtaposition for the purpose, but also in, in connection with what you're saying, kind of the way that he writes, the way that he you know, creates this is – you know, I was saying earlier about like the sadness that's underneath. It's mm -hmm. like all of this stuff is maximalist. It feels like in a way. So he doesn't go insane telling you a very simple story about his nephew, you know, yeah. like, yeah. So I, I, I really like that. I like how it's like wrapped up in that about, you know, it's not, this is to keep us sane. We've got to go mad for this little period of time. That's really true. I really, that, that makes a lot of sense. That really works. And it's such a good book. I like the I like the dialogue part a lot. Like even it's funny because it does he does have that stuff about like hating the dialogue thing and going to do it. But I think it's fun. Like I, I enjoy it. I mean, it does have that that moment where it's like just listing all the all the movies. <laughs> like it's like the most unnatural sort of form of dialogue in a way, but also like basically how Rodrigo interacts. <laughs> it makes total sense. But it's pretty good. Like the two voices are different. Mm -hmm. you know, like for someone who hates dialogue, like you know. It's pretty good job at it like you never lose the thread of who's talking i only did at one point when they got into that film section where tarkovsky makes me sleepy he he doesn't make dreams Fellini, not him either i had to go back and say like who is the writer who is Ella? one thing that this funny too is that I, there it's always fun to find the one that you know so or like the references so on 98 i have something here susan sontag wrote um, an introduction to an Icelandic writer, almost the last one she wrote, where she stipulates that time and space are mutable in the dream novel, the dream play. Time can always be revoked. Space is multiple. And I remember that specifically is from Under the Glacier. I, and I remember I was proofing it. I went and got the book to make sure that we had the line correct in there. Because I, that was like the one time it's like, oh, that's Susan Sontag introduction. is like, boom, I know that. I know that book. That was awesome. <laughs> so smart for like seven seconds. But man... Oh, there were, oh, <laughs> I got to tell you this. <laughs> okay, so there's a bit on page 95 where it says that people like um, do all kinds of things in their sleep. The sleep disorders of night terrors, bedwetting, narcolepsy, teeth grinding, talking and making love and eating and even texting while asleep. It says, really? Seriously? What do people text? That's what I'm dreaming? <laughs> Which is really funny. I found a text to myself from like 4 a.m. in the morning, like a couple weeks ago, that I think was supposed to be the plot to a book. Um, let me see if I can find it again. It's, it says, Let's not confuse drunk and dreaming, though. Those are different things, <laughs> by the way. Okay. Just because you don't remember doing it doesn't mean you were dreaming. Okay. 
I somehow woke I somehow woke up and texted myself and it says something like before you fall in the puddle when you learn that there are no superheroes. And I was like, what the fuck is that? I don't know what, what, what that was, but 442 in the morning, I apparently texted this to myself. That sounds like the Billy Eilish uh, <laughs> follow up. Where, where was I when I was dreaming? <laughs> I was just somewhere. I was in a puddle, apparently. Oh, man. What other person did you guys really like in this? I really enjoyed the dialogue um, part of it. And again, I, I, I think part of it was just the primer of here's why dialogue is lame and here's why I don't like Chekhov and now I'm going to do a bunch of dialogue, but I'll just do it a little bit different. Okay. <laughs> it's almost sure. like if you're, if you're super smart and super cynical, like it's the only way you can do a, yeah. a scene of dialogue versus just, you know, like me, I'll just write it and you know, uh, whatever low hanging fruits, pretty good for me. I don't have to reach for it. Ha ha. <laughs> like, like, so I, I just love the way he, pres I love the way he like sets it up and then executes and, yeah, uh, I just had to give a two and a half hour lecture uh, on dialogue last week. So I was very on the forefront. Yeah, it was brutal. <laughs> all, all on Zoom. Uh, so, yeah, fun times. Yeah, Zoom is but it, it's been on the forefront of my thought. I've been reading a lot about it and stuff. So um, that part was great. On, on page 85 is um, when Nobokov is talking about how to use dialogue correctly. Is that a shot across the bow on um, uh, Steinbeck? The uh, formless speeches filling page after page over which the eye skims like a flying saucer over the dust bowl. I Do you think, think that's a, uh, cause Steinbeck was like, you know, Steinbeck was a big, he used a lot of dialogue was had a lot of opinions on dialogue. I wonder if that's uh Nabokov having like a little shot at a uh, contemporary. That's really funny. There was, I didn't put this up, um, but with the Nabokov stuff too, I think that there's a book of his dreams that came out last year. Or like a dream journal that he kept. That I know that Rodrigo is reading. It's called Insomniac Dreams: Experiments with Time by Vladimir Nabokov. This is his dream diary. Huh. Um, was published in October fourteenth, nineteen sixty-four. Um, Vladimir Nabokov, a lifelong insomniac, foreshadowing, um, began a curious experiment. Over the next eighty days, immediately upon waking, he wrote down his own dream. Um, and th this book was published like last year. So. I think of that, I, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think, I don't know if he read it before he wrote this, but it's interesting that, that Nabokov is in here and that that book, his dream journal exists as well. Yeah. Cool. I, mean, I always meant to buy it because he mentioned it to me and I, I didn't, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get the ebook from somewhere. That's when you know you've made it. It's like Lydia Davis, like she writes something down on a cocktail napkin at the airport and it's published in a book. Here's some shit I wrote down. Can we publish it? All right, whatever. Yeah, sure. It's just, a, it's just an idea I had on the back of a receipt. We'll take it. <laughs> it's now a story. <laughs> that's when you made it. That is true. That is yeah, true. 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 That's true genius there. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what the when the Bokov's dreams would have been like. Very weird. Butterf all right, it's all all butterflies and rape. I'm sure. Yep. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's funny though. Bef but before reading this on that dialogue talk, I brought up Novikov and his use of dialogue and how efficient and fantastic it was. So yeah, well, it's just kind of randomly you, cool. That, for your dialogue talk, what did you what did you what did you use as examples for your dialogue talk? Or who were your what did you learn or what did you focus? Um, on? Well, it was it was more of kind of a beginner class, so I wanted to keep it very. Uh, simple and straightforward, and I mostly used uh, Hemingway as like a more literary example, and then I used Elmore Leonard as a more kind of like day-to-day -day example. But um, but I mean, this is like trying to get people to say like, "What are you doing?" He questioned, like trying to like get rid of that kind of stuff. Like, we're talking like very base level. Like this wasn't a real intense talk, right? Like, <laughs> They're not, they're not ready for JR. That's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the pinnacle of the dialogue mountain. Have you read that before, Brian? No, I have not. Oh, have you read it, Derek? JR, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is yeah. It is wonderful. It is an amazing, in terms of dialogue, like it feels almost unbelievable how long it is and how consistent those voices are. Nope. Nobody's identified very often. 
at all. And you can read like the first hundred pages and then go anywhere in that book and know exactly who's speaking from like yeah. almost no time. It's, yep, right. it's amazing. It's an amazing feat. And anyone if for for creating voices and how to create different voices and how to create different kind of ways of speaking, I don't know that there's a better example that's been written. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. I don't know. I actually tend to be a little bit like uh, the narrator here. I, I'm not a big fan of dialogue for the most part. I mean, I, I think it's not typically what I go towards. You know, it's interesting. You said Leonard and, and Hemingway in, in an introductory way, and Raymond Chandler's my favorite dialogue, right spot in the middle there, you know, where it's, it's yeah. real, you know, but, it, but it's so pithy and stuff, but it's just, it's fun to read, you know, but it's right in between being literary and, and real. But for the most part, like if he hadn't mentioned in that beginning, not liking Chekhov, I wonder if I would have even noticed that there's not much dialogue in these books. I mean, this is a thousand pages now I've read and didn't even notice. Oh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of dialogue. You know, like I don't typically miss it when it's not there. It was cool to see that he could also master that, <laughs> you know, but it, it, you kind of notice how much there is lacking throughout the other two books. True. It's it's interesting because there's there might not be dialogue, but there's definitely voices. And like in the contrast to like thinking of like um some of the more like not Sabald per se, but the Sabaldian type of writers that use a lot of exposition and descriptive passages and very like oh there's like the book Esther Kins Esther Esther Kinsey um River is very much like this where there's now no dialogue and it's like very descriptive. And this has like much more energy and juice than those books in a lot of ways to me. And feels like different voices are are speaking as if the dialogue is like within the text itself rather than a person to person sort of idea. Yeah. Scratch. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use it. I like because just because I think that this in some ways dialogue is just like creating a voice and creating a character through that in a way. Well, and so many times it's used, it's used here effectively the same way as a way to flesh out an argument. Mm -hmm. and a dialogue right in, in sort of a, a different way. And this, I, I still think that most of the dialogue is focused on the rational versus the irrational and then sort of the limits of rationality, you know, because we know eventually that these experiments are going to have side effects that are going to, you know, produce the white plague and it's going to be awful, you know, and, and he is already you know, the he that's, that's in these dialogues is already hinting at, well, you know, this could happen. Have you thought about this? You know, and it, it's setting up that kind of argument, I feel like. There's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's like a, a in both of the books, like a, a serious nod towards like the idea of creativity and where it can even come from, like the invented part, like where does the invented part come from? It's not, you're not just writing your life, um, you're creating something or inventing something that makes it, makes it tellable. And in here, dreams serve that function as like the, without the dreams, we don't have a certain amount, we're too rational. There's, there's a lack of, uh, of creativity in some sense, and opposing those two things too. Yeah, it's fun. I think in the first season, you guys did that, you know, what would be your blurb for this? You know, like funny idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I remember thinking my blurb would be, Ever wonder how writers get their ideas? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the inventive part, you know, which is like the thing he hates throughout the whole text, right? But it's kind of true. It's like, well, this is it. You know, here you go. Yep, yep. I think the, the copy for this, I think, was written by Will Vanderheiden. I'm almost positive that he wrote it, and we just tweaked it a bit for the for the catalog, and then just used it in the end. So all on you, Will. Um, <laughs> we'll have to do that again. This one, this is another impossible book to like summarize in like a pithy statement. Unless it's unless you only take this section. This section would work under your um crazy uh, scheme, Brian, of like actors. I forget how how does it go. Like there's like the the jacket copy has something like you have to begin with like the name of the character and like what they're doing. With a, a question about them, a problem, so, a very specific formula. I think it starts with like blank, insert name of character is a blank, give their occupation, who is blank, and like, <laughs> what do they want, or, you know. The writer is a writer, <laughs> a recurring dream. Yeah. 
but suddenly <laughs> insert inciting incident, <laughs> right? Suddenly, that's where the record, nobody that's else where the record scratch happens on the, on the yeah. movie trailer. Yeah. But when suddenly he turns into his dad, <laughs> <laughs> his life turns upside down. Can he go, can an eighth grader run a multi-billion dollar corporation? <laughs> like that's the... There's the there's where the record scratch happens. Yeah. <laughs> when oh. the person wakes up and he's like, "Oh no!" <laughs> That's amazing. I'm, I'm Judge Reinhold. I'm Judge Reinhold. All of a sudden, what am I gonna do now? Yeah. I'm not Fred Savage anymore. <laughs> like that's it's that movie. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's the equation I have to do all back jacket copy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was interesting too. The entire dialogue is in like the uh, typewriter font. The yeah, like the the footnote, right? Yeah, but it is it is a footnote. Like the, uh, I have a funny thing about that. So yeah, because it says like I'm gonna do. Where is it? It's right before it starts. It says uh, where he bashed his check off. <laughs> no, no, after that. Yeah, wait. It is. Uh, da, da, da. 85? Yeah, here it is. I'm 86. Where it's like, um, but as a kind of apology for his almost zombie-like artificiality, this is a dream conversation with high informational content that more than one person will want to jump over. But if you do so, jump over it the way you jump a friend, the smile of a cheap wearing the height of a wolf. The conversation bursting of names and titles that he hopes he'll be forgiven for here. So this be his apology and excuse by turning it into the longest footnote, scrambling up onto the shoulders of all of this and sitting down and leaning back and resting its neck and falling asleep and dreaming. And then we get that uh, dream conversation, a conversation about dreams. Um, yeah, it's super, super fun. That's cool, yeah. Fun. I love it. I'm really enjoying rereading this again, too. This is like a good thing to, to pass the time. <laughs> As we say, pass, pass the time. The two things that I'm doing are like reading books slowly but surely and like not chewing my fingernails for the first time in my life. So I can like tap. Like I have fingernails finally. I've never, I always am chronic nail biter. Like I've never had nails. I also never shaving again, I don't think. I just, <laughs> so like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be like Howard Hughes in like a day. <laughs> the silver lining of pandemic. I can tap my fingers on things. <laughs> yeah, so I am. <laughs> how come nobody told me how fun it was to have fingernails? It's wild, you can make sounds. Like, I have no idea, it was my mind. I've got an empty box of puffs as house slippers. They slide nice, it's <laughs> fun. Yep. There's a lot of good coming. A Pringles can can hold about two bladders worth of urine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm terrified of germs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all kind of tracks. We're all gonna be Howard Hughes by the end of this, aren't we? <laughs> yes, absolutely we are. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's the pull quote for this uh, for this episode. <laughs> a can of Pringles can hold two bladders of urine. Join us on episode two. <laughs> As we're all going stir crazy in our quarantine. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, how? Yeah, not to derail this, but how are you guys holding up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds like doesn't matter. Same, same, same old, same old. Nah, my wife works at the hospital. We're gonna get it, so whatever. So, so I don't <laughs> get get it too bad. But I'm just, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna get shot. I just hope it's not in the face. Like that's basically what it is. Like I know I'm gonna get shot. Just to, hopefully it's just like in the leg and I'll be okay. But yeah, whatever. Yeah. I thought the eventual like upending of our world would be more instantaneous. So the only thing that I've been feeling is the shock of slow motion. You know, like yeah coming really <laughs> so it's like you see it the whole time so that yeah i thought my skin would be boiling from the nuclear blast not like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey you got three weeks until this is going to crush your face <laughs> oh cool <laughs> right. it's a great point that was a really good point yeah <laughs> and it's like i i, I think that i would have liked to have hoped that i would have done something more productive you know, like if you gave me this scenario, but it turns out not at all. I'm gonna watch the Tiger King. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his his last words before getting put on the ventilator were Joe Exotic. 
<laughs> that sucks. Well, that sucks. <laughs> oh, my oh my god! So, no, do you guys have anything else you wanted to talk about with this inspection? No, I'm running out of battery. So, so you, why don't you tell us what your favorite line was? Uh, see, so I'll just thumb through till I find something underlined. I guess. Do you have one? I have primer one. ready to go. Sure. I do, but I want to find something first. So some else go. I laughed. I just put a big ha on page 75. I already mentioned it. Again, just in case, is there anybody out there? How many possible readers has he already lost having written all this like he did back in the days when he wrote and slept and dreamed of writing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I love so. that. I thought about I thought about you, Chad, during that part because somebody telling you their dream is a little bit like somebody telling you about their fantasy team. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, Aspect. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't want to know who's hitting 300. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody hits 300 anymore. That's a dream. And plus, and it has like the, it has the sneaky reference to, I assume it's, uh, what is anybody out there? Is that the wall? Pink Floyd? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody out there? Right? Yeah. Which yeah. Is, my favorite part was <clears throat> back to that same theme of, of the scientific on page 67. The history of humanity and even the great scientific advances is overrun with episodes and errors like this, but none of them was as important and decisive as the one they caused with their triumphant defeat. But unlike what happened on other occasions, no serendipity here, it wasn't by seeking something miraculous they found something else, more or less marvelous. So nothing good and everything really, really bad. The worst came of turning on the lights of the white plague. Yeah, that's Wild, that's great. The one that I like is back to the modern side of things. In 65, every time he sees her, he sees again how he falls in love, how he stays in love, how he'll love her until the end of his dreams, until the end of the last dream he has left. Jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm lonely, guys. It was darker so hearing you read it than it was reading it in my own head. <laughs> <laughs> it's also it's pretty. It's pretty. It's beautiful. It's a little heartbreaking, just a touch. So next week, um, I think Patrick Smith's going to come on, and we're going to talk about the first of it'll take us three episodes to get through the second section. The other night, irrational catalog for an exhibition of restless shadows, and for the first one for next week, we'll talk about pages one twelve through one fifty five, um, and this is where we go back to Penelope. So we switch from the writer to his sister. We'll, we'll try and recap uh, her story, uh, where it was last, last, the next episode we can recap where she was, but we get into the sister side of things now for a while. Oh, perfect. Just as I get some footing, we'll uh, pull the rug out. Sounds yeah, great. and you'll pull the rug out in a very intuitive <laughs> ways that are really interesting. Yes, yeah. Can't, a lot of just along for the ride. And some tulpas. Wuthering Heights plus tulpas. This is gonna be, this is a fun time. That's a great section. But anyways, again, anyone listening, download the book for free up until April 1st. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything you want to plug, Brian? No, just uh, be kind, be be safe, and let's just be human. Enjoy each other. We do still have plenty of time for love and connection, even in a weird, weird time. So not to be sappy, but that's, that's all. I used to read about a dream lover. Um <laughs> Which again would be and that uh, and, and go watch, watch watch Dream Lover and if you survive it go read some good books yeah read some books uh, Derek where can people where can people find you online um, at Twitter I'm on at Derek Main Reads mm -hmm. so follow me there I always put up my video reviews and what I'm reading what I'm getting into at the moment and it is D R E K M A I N E Reads yes who's listening and that doesn't see it that's um, right Main like the state. Like the state. Absolutely. And yeah, check out the check out the YouTube. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Read the world. You get lots of good reviews of lots of great books from all over. So awesome. Thank you. Watch you your everywhere. You, you stay safe too. Have fun, uh, home I'm gonna go back and uh and continue dreaming and crying for a while. So you know, there's that. <laughs>